without a doubt, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my entire life was joining the United States Navy. And after 13 years of faithful and dedicated service, ironically enough, one of the hardest decisions that I ever had to make was transitioning out of that same Navy. And because for me this transition was so mentally taxing, I had to go on a journey of, let's call it self-discovery. And what I found in that journey is that the same organization that gave me this great life, made me travel the world, helped me form great connections, and probably responsible for the man I am today, is also responsible for veterans having a hard time transitioning and functioning in society. Did you know that there's an estimated 22 veterans dying every single day from suicide? That's 8,030. 8,030 estimated suicides happen in every single year. To put that in perspective, the war in Iraq lasts just around eight years and it claimed the lives of just about 4,000 service members. Veteran suicides is doing that number double in one year. And just when you think that this is problematic, we now know that there's no correlation between combat and suicide. Meaning that the soldier, the sailor, the airman, the marine who sat behind his desk his entire military career is just as likely and sometimes more likely to commit suicide than the veteran who been to combat, seen war, and even PTSD. Now let me be clear, this is not an attempt to say that one thing is greater than the next. It's just that the sad reality is, combat or no combat, there's something happening where veterans are at risk. While I served, I was a Navy recruiter. In fact, I was a great recruiter, one of the best in the state of Columbus, Ohio at the time. And all that means is that I had to adhere to the law of averages. I had to talk to everybody. And in return, I put a boatload of people in the Navy, pun intended. <laughs> and when you're collecting data, when you're talking to the masses, you start recognizing patterns. And one of the things that I realized is that people will join the military for one of two reasons. And the first reason is inspiration. Inspiration because maybe their great-grandfather served. Inspiration because maybe they're military brats. Inspiration because they have a friend who joined the military, they're traveling the world, they're doing great things, and now they're inspired to be like them. But the second and the most prevalent reason that people will join was out of desperation. Because what I also realize is that desperate people, they're always running from something. I had clients who were kicking their kids out of the house as soon as they turned 18. So they had to run from their house. I had people who had their master's degree that couldn't function in today's society, so they were running from the economy. I had people who had the ultimatum of either going to the Navy or going to jail. So obviously, they don't want to go to jail. As a filmmaker, one of the things that I do, I analyze scripts. And when I'm analyzing a script, I'm looking for something called subtext. And subtext simply mean the meaning behind the words, the underlying message. So when an applicant comes into my office, especially out of desperation, what he's telling me, what he's telling himself, what he's telling the world, what he's telling God, the subtext, I don't know who I am, I don't have an identity. And when you don't have an identity, ladies and gentlemen, I'm inclined to believe that we don't have purpose. And when there's no purpose, there's a chance you may not have direction. And without direction, we are confused. And when we're confused, we're scared and we're desperate. And what do scared people do? They run. They run into my office screaming, I don't have an identity. Help me to escape my present reality. You see, it's like each and every one of these applicants, they, it's like they're riding a bicycle. And if you know anything about a bicycle, it keeps its poise and its equilibrium as long as there's a destination and it's moving forward. But unfortunately for a lot of these applicants, they're trying to balance their lives. They're trying to balance this bicycle while standing still. 
Not to mention they're carrying heavy bags on their back. Bags of anxiety, bags of depression, bags of I don't know who I am. And a recruiter, we step in. We hold that bicycle. We take those bags off their back one by one. We put the kickstand down. And for the first time in a long time, they see hope. And we give them three things that changes their lives forever. And the first thing we give them is identity. And this starts in boot camp. Because it's literally impossible for a civilian to become an airman, a soldier, a marine, a sailor, unless he goes through boot camp. Boot camp at its core is psychological engineering at its finest, and rightfully so, with the premise of taking a civilian and turn him into a service member. There's no coincidence that one of the first things we learn in boot camp is a creed. And every branch has a creed. Now, if we pay attention to each and every one of these creeds, what we'll find is one thing in common. We will see the words, I am and I will. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you know anything about those words, I am, you will understand that those two words are the most powerful words on the planet because anything that follows it starts the creation of it. So they go through boot camp saying this creed, this mantra, hundreds, if not thousands of times. And by the time they graduate, they are no longer a civilian. They are transformed by the renewal of their minds. The second thing we give them is tribe. Now humans, all of us, we are innately tribal. In fact, we are definitively better in every aspect of our lives when we get around social groups that we can identify with. And in boot camp, we sleep together, we eat together, we even shower together. We practice no man is left behind. We complete the task at hand together. There's a sense of pride and camaraderie and brotherhood, none of which we felt in civilian world, AKA modern society. And then we graduate boot camp and we go onto our ships, we go onto our platoons, we go onto our squadrons. And this brotherhood, this tribe, this community continues to grow so much so that even if you hate somebody next to you, you would still risk your life to save them and you wouldn't even think twice about it. The third thing we give them is purpose. But in my opinion, it's, it's an illusion of purpose because it was given to us. You see, a lot of people believe that military members, they believe we're independent. But that can be further from the truth. Now, I'm not insinuating that we're robots because we use our ingenuity to come up with systems and programs that makes the military a better place. But the reality is, we're being told what to do every single day. We're told when to eat. Sometimes we're told when to sleep. We're told when to go to medical. We're told when to go to dental. We're told what to wear and when to wear it. We get a paycheck every first and 15, regardless if we work or not. And it comes a sense of convenience and security from that. But the reality is, we have a reason to wake up every single morning. We have sailors and soldiers and airmen to take care of. We have a mission to complete, a task at hand. We have given purpose. And with these three things, ladies and gentlemen, our identity, our tribe, and our purpose, we go out throughout our military careers. Five, 10, 15, even 25 years. And it's fortified and it's crystallized. And it becomes part of who we are. But now, it's time to get out. And the military, honestly, has gotten great over the years. They say, hey, here's a transition program about a week, and here's a multitude of resources, which is great. But unfortunately for the veteran who's been told what to do his entire life, one week is not enough. And even with all those resources, there's a chance he might not be resourceful. So now, he's terrified. The same veteran who was a hero, the same veteran who deployed hundreds of times, the same veteran who led hundreds of sailors and soldiers, he's terrified to get out. And I believe the reason he's terrified deep down inside the subtext is because he knows he's going to lose two other things he was given. And the first thing he loses is his tribe. Because here's the reality about military members. The only people that we know, the only friends that we have, are other military members. 
What's even more problematic, veterans are finding it hard to connect with civilians, especially in the nine to five sector. Because civilians, they're on survival mode. Every man for themselves. So at the end of the day, our veterans, we need to stand together. We need to unite as one. So instead of saying, once a Marine, always a Marine, why not say, once a Marine, always a veteran? Because by definition, this is who you are now. Identity is what drives behavior. And because we no longer have a creed that's viable in the real world, we no longer have a purpose, we no longer have a tribe, we are creating the pain of incongruence in our lives, and we are suffering because of it. And incongruence simply means, ladies and gentlemen, when your ideal self, your self-image, your blueprint about yourself, when it does not match, when it's not congruent with your current reality, your results, the way you would like things to be. The reality is, we cannot consistently perform in a manner that's inconsistent with how we see ourselves. So if it's possible to take a civilian and turn him into a service member, then it's not inconceivable that we can reverse engineer that process by giving them a new creed, one that's viable in the real world, helping them to forge a new identity so they may have tribe, they may have purpose, and they may have community and congruence in society. Look, I get it. Suicide, it's complicated. And even though suicide is complicated, I'm thankful that there's a multitude of organizations every day fighting a good fight to combat against suicide. But here's what we know and we can safely deduce about suicide. We know that when a veteran unalives himself, we know that he feels alone. So I'm inclined to believe he doesn't have a tribe. He doesn't have a brotherhood. We also know he doesn't have a reason to live. So I'm inclined to believe he doesn't have a task at hand, a mission to complete. He doesn't have purpose. And now he's left with an identity, one that is not congruent with his present reality. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, he's suffering the pain of incongruence because of it. So as a, as a recruiter, I would like to recruit each and every one of you here today because this message is not just for veterans. It's for all of us. So I would like to recruit you to find your empowering identity. I would like to recruit you to find your empowering tribe. And I would love to recruit you to find your empowering purpose so we may have congruence and find happiness in society. Because if there's no happiness, then what else is there? And for my veterans, you should be proud of the fact that you serve. But I simply ask that we hang up this identity and forge a new one. And we can start by saying, once a Marine, always, and I mean always, a veteran. Because by definition, this is who you are now. Identity drives behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, help me change the world by first changing the man. Because as a man think in his heart, so is he. And as he continue to think, so he shall remain. Thank you.